It's perfectly possible to use Linux and not use Bash. Why the hell would you? Right? Bash is really the powerhouse at the very core of Linux, and it enables really insane productivity. I'm Andrew, and I'll happily admit that I'm a little bit socially awkward. Um, some might even go as far as to say dysfunctional. But here I feel right at home, and that's because uh, you guys are my people, and uh, thank you for being here. Um, I, I'm a reformed physicist, but currently running a, a data science and consulting uh, and a training consultancy out of Durban and Cape Town. And my, my first experience of, of Linux happened uh, back in, in 1994 when I installed Slackware 1.1 from a truly enormous stack of stiffies. And this was quite an arduous undertaking, but it was a complete game changer for me, and I really have not looked back. I work almost exclusively in Linux in general and in Bash in particular nowadays. I guess that before talking a bit about Bash, it makes sense to, to set some historical context. So let's consider where Bash actually comes from. So there's a bit of a lineage here. The, the initial shell was developed by a guy called Ken Thompson. Uh, it was re released in 1971. And Thompson did his work at Bell Labs. And the initial, the initial Thompson shell was extremely functional. Um, you know, it had things like redirection and, and piping, which we kind of take for granted as an integral part of the, the shell nowadays. But it was completely interactive. In other words, there was no capability for scripting. Whatever you did occurred in the shell, and when the shell, when you exited the shell, that was the, the end of, of that code. And then Stephen Bourne was obviously working away on something in the background that was going to take Thompson's shell and make it just that little bit better. And in 1977, he released the Bourne shell. And this addressed some of the shortcomings in the original Thompson shell. It introduced uh, a couple of control flow features. So for example, uh, there were conditionals and loops, as well as, as variables. And this was an enormous leap forward in functionality. But probably the most important thing about the Bourne shell was that you could actually write scripts. Then in 1989, around about the time I was finishing school, Brian Fox released the Born Again shell. Now, Fox, I guess, decided to go against the eponymous route that had been adopted by Thompson and Born, and he chose to do something a little bit more kind of witty in naming his shell, you know, Born Again, rather than the Fox shell. Um, he also released this code uh, open source, which of course is very important for all of us. And Bash, the Born Again shell, came along with a glut of uh, new features. Probably the most important for me personally, uh, the fact that it has uh, command or tab completion, you have access to a command history, and it also implements functions. But this is just really scraping the surface. There's a bunch of other things in Bash that are also very, very cool. Now, Bash is completely consistent with the, the ideas of the, the Unix philosophy, and these are kind of the, some of the points that are laid out by, by Raymond in his book about the, the art of Unix programming. And I think probably the key elements here for, for Bash are modularity and composition, and that is that you've got a bunch of little tools which you can compose together and in so doing actually achieve sort of something that's much greater than the, the sum of its parts. There's also, of course, the rule of diversity, and, and this becomes readily apparent when you start working with Bash, and that is that there, there are many different ways to achieve the same outcome or to skin the same cat. Now, I like to juxtapose these, the Unix philosophy with the, the Windows philosophy, of course, and that is, can be paraphrased in you know, a million random mouse clicks will actually get the job done in the end. I think we can be a little bit more systematic than that. Okay, so Bash is obviously a great tool, but each of us has our own particular tastes for the way that our tools should work, 
And Bash plays very nicely into this in that you can really configure it to precisely the way that you want it. Um, and to, to lend credence to this is the fact that there are no fewer than three user configuration files for Bash. And in principle, this could be quite a source of confusion, so it's worthwhile just considering exactly what the role of each of these files is in setting up a Bash configuration. So, what role does each of them play, and what will go into each one of them? Right, so let's start off by considering the, the profile files, so dot .profile and dot .bash profile. Now, these are files that are executed in a, a login shell. So, in other words, any shell where you're going to be authenticating yourself. And um, they, there's a very sort of strict order in which these files are executed. So, uh, initially, the, the first one that's going to be executed is going to be the, the system level profile. So, it sets your profile. And once that has run, then there's a hierarchy depending on just exactly what you have present in your home folder. So, if you have a .bash profile, that will be executed. Failing that, the .profile file will run. And what typically goes into these files? Well, in the case of dot .profile, you're typically thinking about just defining environment variables. And there's a very good reason for that, and that is that dot .profile is going to be executed regardless of what shell you're running. So if it's bash, it's got to run, but if it's fish or Z shell or corn, it's got to be run as well. So you can't have any bash-specific functionality sitting in, in dot .profile. Then you've got your bash rc file, and this is the one that's going to be run if you're launching a non-interactive bash session. And this is typically where you're going to set up your aliases and actually customize precisely the way that you want bash to work for you. Okay, so what are the kinds of things that you put into each of these files? Well, as I mentioned, profile is typically where you're going to be setting up all of your environment variables, and you have to take into account that these have to work in multiple shells in principle. So, for example, you might add elements to your path, you may set up some things regarding the language that you're working in, so your locale, set up your editor, and I guess paths, to your linker path, and I'm an, an avid R user, so I specify just exactly where my R, local R library is going to be. Something that's worthwhile knowing about this and it's potentially a sticking point for people when they start configuring Bash, is adding elements onto the path. Now, I'm sure that many of you know about this, but you might be tempted to use the little tilde shortcut for the home folder. And of course, this doesn't work in your path because that tilde is not going to be expanded. So it's important to, to take into account, if you're adding elements to your path, you've always got to use the, the home environment variable rather than the tilde. It's a handy thing to know. What about bash rc? Well, everything that doesn't go into a dot .profile, with, exception, with a few exceptions, is going to end up going into your bash rc file. And you can see, for example, at the top of my bash rc file, I check whether I've got this bash aliases file. We're going to come back and talk about aliases a little bit later on. If it's present, then I'm going to source that. And then I have a couple of shell customization options. And it, there are a whole bunch of these, but they may be worthwhile just taking a look at them for a moment. So, for example, this first one, check wind size. Bash actually defines two environment variables, so lines and columns, and by specifying this check wind size option, those will be dynamically updated as you change the, the um, geometry of your window. And this can be quite nice if you have functions or aliases that actually rely on your window geometry. So say, for example, you want to have a separator of hyphens and you want that to be as wide as the console. Well, you can update that dynamically if you just take into account that the number of columns is going to be updated. CD spell, this is, this is great if you're a sloppy typer like I am. Right? CD spell takes into account that you might misspell a folder or directory name. So for example, if you're changing to slash bin or and you type bj in, for example, it will automatically infer that you actually want to go to the bin folder rather than bj in. Histopend, we're going to be talking about the bash history, and histopend simply says don't take the current history and clobber the previous history, rather just append onto the existing list of history commands. Okay, there are a whole host of other configuration options that you can specify here. 
But it might occur to you that we've got these two separate files that pertain to different situations. So we've got some files that work in a login shell and another one that works in a non-login shell. And so potentially you might have a completely different environment depending on whether you've logged in or whether you've simply just launched another shell. And this, of course, is not ideal. You want that environment to be completely consistent every single time. And the way around this is to use Bash Profile. So Bash Profile allows you to bridge the difference between those two eventualities. So if you remember that the, the hierarchy, the order in which these things are going to be run, is that you have the, the system files are executed first, and then it checks for .bash profile. If that's present, it executes it, but ignores .profile. So if we want to always have .profile and bash rc executed in a login shell, then we set this up, this behavior, in .bash profile. So you might have code that looks like this. Check if .profile is present. If so, execute it. Check if bash rc is present. If so, execute it. And this means that whichever way you get into the shell, be it login or non-login, the environment that you're going to be working in is precisely the same. Another thing that you may choose to put into the bash profile is any kind of time-consuming operation. Now, when, when I launch another terminal or another tab in my terminal emulator, I want that to pop up immediately. I don't have to want to delay for things happening in the background. And this potentially can be the case, for example, if you're configuring things like Travis or setting up a, a wrapper for the virtual environments in Python, those things, okay, they're not going to run for seconds, but they run for fractions of a second, and this can just be a little bit irking, right? So if you want those things to still apply in your session, but not to be launched every time you run a new shell, then you put them into bash profile. So they run once when you authenticate, Obviously, they're going to apply subsequently for all of the shells that you spawn. OK, a little bit of trivia. Does anyone have any idea what the RC at the end of bash RC stands for? <laughs> yeah, absolutely, run commands. Very nice. I, I, I will happily admit I had to look this up. <laughs> But it's, it's worthwhile knowing, right? RC is run commands. And of course, we know that in your home folder, you've probably got a whole bunch of these RC files. It's nice to know what RC means. OK, so I suppose, speaking strictly for myself, the first thing you want to customize in Bash is the prompt, right? Because you, you watch any sort of YouTube videos about Bash online, and people have got these fantastic prompts with a whole bunch of useful information stashed in there, right? Um, how exactly do you get from that plain vanilla dollar prompt to something just a little bit more informative? Well, I guess before we talk about customizing the prompt, let's just dispense with one thing, and that is that it's a mistake to refer to the bash prompt in the singular. There is no singular bash prompt. In fact, there are four, right? So there's PS1, PS2, PS3, and PS4. Nobody knows what PS3 and PS4 are for, okay? Maybe Brian Fox does. I, I don't. You're, you're very, very seldom ever encounter them. But PS1 and PS2, those are the ones that you're going to encounter very frequently, and certainly PS1 all the time. PS2 is the prompt that appears if you have a command that's broken across multiple lines. So for example, if you start off typing a command and you then want to break it onto a new line, so you escape the end of line character with a backslash, the prompt that you get on the following line, that's PS2, right? So in this case, PS1 being the dollar and PS2 being the greater than sign. I guess very seldom is anyone going to configure anything except PS1. Okay, so how do we go about tweaking these things? Well, there's a selection of control characters which you can insert into the environment variable for PS1 or PS2, if that's what floats your boat. So in addition to some sort of static content that you might have, you can use these to dynamically generate content within your prompt. So for example, if you had a PS1 that was slash U slash H, then that slash U is going to be substituted with your username. 
and the slash h with the host name. That's immediately pretty informative. So you know what user you're operating at as, and you know what system you're on. Are you on your local machine, or are you on an SSH connection to an AWS instance? OK, you can also have a prompt that, dy that dynamically updates with the date. So using slash d and a format string, you can choose that date and time setting in an arbitrary way. Every time you enter a new command, your shell prompt will be updated with the new date and the new time. And you can also have things, for example, like the history number, and we'll be talking about the history a little bit later, as well as the working directory. An interesting thing to note here is that this double backslash dollar, that dollar is the, the prompt that appears if you're a normal user as a dollar, but if you change to the root user, you would expect that to become the hash sign, right? Just to designate that you're no longer a plain vanilla user. A useful thing to set up is the ability to revert from your highly customized prompt to something super simple. And the reason this is a useful thing to have is that having all of this information embedded in your prompt can actually be really confusing for other people. Right? You're used to exactly what your prompt looks like, but if you're presenting your work, you don't want people to be distracted by your prompt, that you want them to be focusing on the content. So I have a function called simple prompt. Whenever I run that, my prompt is going to just revert to a simple dollar. And this is great, for example, if you're making a screencast. But there's something missing in the prompts that I've just shown you. I think you can guess what that is, right? We demand color. Well, certainly my three-year-old demands color, right? So how can we take these drab and boring, if not informative prompts, and make them a little bit more interesting? Well, there are additional control sequences for doing precisely this. So for example here, this definition of PS1 has these two control sequences, where one of them turns on the color green, and the other one turns off the color green. And in between, you've got this backslash W, which stands for the working folder. And that's why the working folder in this case, my temporary directory, is colored green. Now, there's a fairly limited palette of colors available to you, and they're enumerated down here. And these codes are what you see entering into the first control sequence. So for example, if rather than having green there, I wanted to have blue, I would go and find the code for blue, so 0 semicolon 34, and I'd replace 1 semicolon 32 with 0 semicolon 32 34. An important thing to bear in mind that if you're colorizing your prompt, is that whenever you turn a color on, you've got to turn it off again before you turn the next color on. This is super important, otherwise, it will end in tears. And also, an additional piece of advice to you on this is that set this up slowly. Right? Don't go and try and introduce all of these colors at once, because there will be great confusion ensuing. So do colorize your prompt one element at a time. Turning a color on, then turning it off, and then introducing the next color, etc. OK, so you colorize your prompt, but it's also really great to have components of your prompt that will actually be generated dynamically. And I think this is a great one. Um, so it's nice to know what Git branch you're on without having to type Git branch. So here I have a function that's going to go and run Git branch and then do a bit of uh, regular expression replacement and basically just extract the branch name. It's wrapped up in a function. So every time you run pass Git branch, it just returns the name of the branch if you're in a, a folder that, that's part of a repository. And that's now actually embedded into my, the definition of my prompt. So you can see it over there, dollar pass get, pro, get branch. So every time I have a new command, if I'm in a, get, a, a repository, that will form part of the prompt. So you can see it up here, for example, supposing I had a, a git repository in my temporary folder, which seems a little bit unlikely, then I might see that I'm on the master branch, which would be a handy piece of information to have. Okay, 
So let's talk about things that relate more to productivity. And let's start with things that I'm sure are old hats to everyone here, and that is keyboard shortcuts. So how can we navigate around Bash just a little bit more efficiently? So moving around on the command line. Control A will get you back to the beginning of the line. Control E will get you to the end of the line. This is great. What about clearing the screen? This, if you have OCD and you don't like a messy terminal, is great. Control L will get rid of everything. It's also super handy if you don't want people to see what was previously present on your terminal. What about the command history? We were talking about the command history quite a bit later on, but these are some of the, the keyboard shortcuts that you'd use to navigate around the history. So up arrow and down arrow, that's allow you to basically just go back and forth around, along your history. Control R, Control R and then you start typing, that's gonna start searching back through your history, which is great. And exclamation, exclamation, will execute the last element of your history. What about job control? We're gonna be launching jobs, putting them into the background, bring them back to the foreground. Control C and Control Z are important here. Control C is gonna kill a process dead. Control Z is gonna temporarily suspend it, and then you'll have the option of either starting it again in the foreground or pushing it across into the background. Okay, the next level up in sort of the hierarchy of uh, efficiency is creating aliases. Now, aliases are simply command shortcuts, right? So they take a name and assign it to a potentially compound command. So here are some examples that I personally find really useful, okay? If you are, like, if you are used to working in a file browser and rely on the fact that, oh, I can delete something and it'll end up in the trash, and if I discover sometime later on that I actually needed that file, I can always go and dig it out of the trash again. Then when you start working in the terminal and you remove a file and discover that it is gone for good, this can be a bit of an affront, right? So you can set things up in such a way that you're not going to shoot yourself in the foot too badly. So for example, I alias RM, to rm minus capital I. In fact, there are two options here. So minus I, lowercase, can be a little bit annoying because every time you remove a file, it's gonna say, are you sure? Capital I is only going to check if you're sure if you would in principle delete three or more files. So in other words, it's basically limiting the amount of damage that you can do in deleting files. I'm a little bit torn between which of these is going to be the most useful. And then CP minus I and MV minus I, well this basically just helps you from not taking a file and copying it across or moving it across onto another existing file and thereby clobbering the contents of that file. Like we don't want that to happen either. And using both of these aliases, you're going to get prompted. Are you sure you want to do that? Here are another couple of useful ones. So if I want to check my disk usage, sending me back numbers that are in bytes, and it's this enormous number, is not particularly helpful for me. I, I want some sort of understandable content. I guess this is because I'm a physicist and I want to have units, right? So by having aliasing df to df minus h, this means that I'm going to get the proportions of used space on each of my partitions in units I understand. Megabytes, gigabytes. You can also take make directory and add in the minus p flag. This is also really, really great because it means that you can create a hierarchy of folders without actually having to create each of those levels individually. So in other words, it's gonna create the parent folders automatically. And ping minus a, well, if you do any kind of networking and you're wanting to check that your connection to a remote machine is persistent, then having ping minus A is super handy because this is gonna literally produce an audible ping for every packet. So having that defined as an alias is a pretty useful thing. What happens if you don't want to use the alias? And this is perfectly reasonable. So for example, if I have a bunch of files in a folder and I know for sure that I don't want those files anymore, how can I ensure that the remove command is literally the base remove command and I'm not gonna be prompted for each of those files? 
Well, there are a couple of options here. I could either use slash bin slash rm. That'll get around the alias. Or alternatively, I could put command before the aliased command. And that will actually use the unaliased version. If you don't want an alias to apply anymore in a session, you can simply use unalias, and that will remove it. So this is quite handy if you temporarily create an alias, you use it, and then you want to get rid of it, you can unalias it. OK, so aliases are super handy, but they're a little bit restrictive in the sense that they are they're static. Right? You set up an alias, it's got some fixed content, as we've seen, but what happens if you want to provide arguments to that alias? Well, that's where functions come into the picture. So you can write functions in Bash just like you can in C or Python or R. And what a function in Bash looks like is basically this. So you have a function name followed by a pair of parentheses and then braces and any number of commands. And those commands are then going to form the body of your function. So for example, this is what a hello function might look like. So the function name, hello, and then the content of the function, so echo, hello world. And when you type hello at the shell prompt, you then get the content of that function being executed. So this is a completely trivial example. So let's add in some arguments. <coughs> arguments in a shell function are referred to using the dollar operator. So for example, dollar one is going to be the first argument to the function, dollar two, the second, etc. There are a couple of other things like dollar star, that's going to give you all of the arguments, and dollar hash is going to give you the number of arguments. So if we want to take our hello function and make it just a little bit more functionally complete, then what we could do is first check if there's more than one argument. So if there are any, if there's zero arguments, then we're going to simply say hello. And if there's more than one, well, we're going to say hello and just use the first argument as a name. And you can see how this would work in practice. So hello by itself just gives you back hello. And if you provide a name, you're going to get that name included in the response. How about something a little bit more useful? Well, this is something that works for me, and I use it frequently. I work with a lot of CSV files, and very often I want to see what the top of the CSV file looks like and the bottom. Okay? Now, I can do this manually by doing head file name, tail file name. But this gets very lame once you've done it a couple of times. So instead, write a function. That function's got to accept a file name, and it's then going to get the head, produce a separator, and then get the tail. So this is what the output might look like, the head, and then the tail. OK, just got the, the signal from the lady at the back there that I have 10 minutes to go, which is Probably about right, because I've got about 10 minutes of content, I guess. So let's talk about command history. This is one of the new features that was introduced by, by Brian Fox and Bash. And well, by default, the history in Bash has got to work really, really nicely. But potentially, you might want to tweak it just to make it work a little bit better. Well, there are a couple of things that you can do. Firstly, you can be selective about what exactly goes into your history. And there are two ways that you can go about doing it. There's the high-level approach, and this is using the hist control environment variable. And this will accept one of three options. So ignore space, ignore dupes, and ignore both. In general, you want to have ignore both, but let's talk about the two options. So ignore dupes, what this is going to do is not append additional elements to your history, if they simply repeat. So very often, I'll be running the same command a few times over. There's no reason that I want to record every instance of exactly the same command. So ignore dupes will remove those duplicates. Ignore space is really handy, because this is going to, on a one-by-one -one basis, allow you to exclude commands from your history. So if you begin a command with a space, it won't be appended to your history. And this is great. If a command, for example, includes some sort of authentication data that you don't want to have lying around, right? So for example, if you're logging into your database and you don't provide the password on the command line, you're entering it in at the prompt, this is fine. I have no issues with that going into my history. But if, for example, I'm actually typing in 
my password as a component of the command, then I definitely don't want that to end up in my history. In order to do that, all I need to do is insert a single space at the beginning of the command, and it will no longer end up in my history file. Then you've got histignore, and this allows you to address individual components of your history with a much greater level of granularity. So histignore is a string of colon delimited elements that will be ignored from the history. So for example, here, um, I'm not going to record any references to man pages or requests for the help pages for functions. Also, clear and ls, those won't be included. So anything that you're basically not interested in retaining as individual history elements can be listed in histignore. How much history do you want to retain? Well, here again, there are two components. How much history do you want to retain in memory within a single shell instance? That'll be specified by hist size. And then hist file size, well, this is how much history is going to be retained in your bash history file on disk. What about the way that your history is actually presented? By default, it'll just be a whole sequence of commands. But it's often useful to know just exactly when you executed a particular command. And you can set that up by defining this hist time format environment variable. And you can use, there's a fair degree of flexibility in determining just exactly what that time and date is going to look like. But the nice thing about this is that your history is then going to have the date and the time at which a particular command was executed. OK, so we've got all these elements in our history. How do we actually leverage them? Well, we've seen a couple of things already. Right, We can go up and down with the arrow keys. We can use Control r to search back through the history. We can also pick out individual elements in the history by using their particular numbers. So the first column here is the actual history number for particular elements. And we can use the exclamation mark to pick out particular commands. So for example, if I wanted to execute command number six, not a particularly interesting one, I would use exclamation mark six. You can also reference backwards from the end of the history by using minus indexing. So exclamation mark minus two, that's the second to last command. And we've already talked about double exclamation mark. That's just the last command. What about some job control? We've got all of these jobs recorded in our history. Some of them are running in the foreground. Some of them are running in the background. How do we make the transition between the two? Well, by default, all of the commands that you run in bash are going to run in the foreground. And this is great, but it also means that they're going to hog the terminal. In other words, you can't do anything else while this job is running in the foreground. So it'd be great to be able to take it and say, OK, you can just execute in the background, and I want to carry on doing other things in the foreground. How do you go about doing this? Well, supposing you have a job that's executing in the foreground. So here we're pinging Google. I want to take this and move it across into the background. Control Z, as I mentioned before, is going to temporarily suspend that job. So after pressing Control Z, that job is kind of in limbo. It's still there, but it's not doing anything. If I want to put it into the background, I simply type BG. It will then start executing, but it will no longer be dominating my terminal. If I want to bring it back to the foreground, simply typing FG will bring it back, and it will now be running interactively in the foreground. So what about launching jobs directly into the background? If you know that a job is not going to be particularly interesting in terms of output, well, you can put it into the background immediately. And you do this by just putting an ampersand at the end of the command line. But you might often have seen this done with a no-hup at the beginning of the line. Now, what is this no-hup all about? Well, the hup refers to the, the hang-up signal. And the hang-up signal is, what's, is a signal that's automatically sent by the system to every job that's running in a shell when that shell terminates. So this typically will occur, for example, if you have an SSH connection to a remote machine. You start up a couple of jobs. You put them all into the background, and you think, oh, OK, now I'm going to log off, go about my business, and I'll come back, log on, and see what happened with those jobs. You'll be sorely disappointed, because immediately you log off, all of those jobs will receive the hub signal, and they'll die. So to get around this, you launch the job with no hub up front, and then ampersand at the end. And what's going to happen is that job will now ignore the hub signal. It's also going to start 
logging output to this nohub.out file. And at this point, you can happily terminate the shell, go about your business with the confidence that that command will continue running in the background. Now, you can, of course, push multiple jobs into the background. And if you want to see what jobs are running, you run the jobs command. And you might have some output that looks like this. On the left-hand side, a job number, so one, two, and three, and then the status of the job. So here I have two jobs that are running in the background and one that's currently suspended. Right? It's still there, but it's not doing anything. And we can use this job number to now manipulate these jobs directly. So for example, if I want to take a particular job, in this case, job number two, and bring it to the foreground, FG, percentage two, that job will be immediately brought to the foreground. You can also take jobs and start them in the background. So for example, number three, which is currently in limbo, if I want that to start executing in the background, I would have BG, percentage three. OK, final thing. How do we go about being super? So very often you want to run a command or a set of commands, but as the, root, as the root user. And there are two ways of going about doing this. The one is to use the SU command. SU stands for substitute user. And what this allows you to do is temporarily assume the identity of another user on the system. Right? So simply typing SU is going to try and become the root user. But in order to do this, you need to provide the root password, which is great if you know the root password. You can also use this, of course, to become any other user on the system. So for example, if I decide I want to become layer, I can SU layer as well. But this, again, relies on the fact that I know layer's password. There's another way of going about doing this, which is a little bit more flexible. And it also allows you to do things on a per command basis. And this is the sudo command, right? Sudo stands for super user do. And this is one command at a time. So for example, if I wanted to change the password for the layer account, I might do sudo password layer. And the interesting thing now is that I'm going to be doing something effectively as root, but I only need to provide the password for my account. Now, of course, in order to do this, I need to be have this capability enabled. So this needs to be configured on the system. But this is the, the default setup on any Ubuntu machine anywhere. And of course, the Spider-Man caveat applies very heavily here, right? You know, with great power comes great responsibility. And of course, things like sudo rm minus rf, you know, probably not a good idea to do that at home, definitely not a good idea to do it at work. OK, so what about finally becoming, becoming root, but by only knowing your password? Well, we've seen that if you just do su, you need to provide the password for the root account. If you do sudo su, right, you're sudoing, which means you'll be using your own password, and you're doing su, which means become the super user. So in this case, you just provide the password for your account. And again, Spider-Man caveat applies. OK. So I, I know that this talk has consisted of like, a lot of little itty-bitty things. And this may sound trite, but if you want to know more about Bash, read the man page. It is probably the longest man page you're ever likely to encounter, but it's super informative. And there's a lot of really interesting things in there. So keep on bashing. So, yep, thank you. I think we have time for one question. Any, any questions? Thanks, Andrew. That was pretty cool. Um, do you have strong opinions about other shells, maybe Z shell in particular? Um, what makes you stick with Bash? Um, hmm. Gordon, that's a good question. I, I guess that... Um, the reason that I'm a fan of Bash was that back in 1994, it was the first shell that I used. And the scope for alternatives back then was not that broad. And um, I guess it's just what I'm accom uh, accustomed to. I think there are probably very strong arguments for other shells. I just don't happen to know them. What's your favorite shell, Gordon? Oh, 
Maybe we're going to have a quick flash poll, okay? Who's a bash user? <laughs> okay. What about uh, fish? Okay, cool. Z shell. Cool. Corn shell. <laughs> you're, you're all alone, sir. <laughs> Well, you've got BC to do it, right? But it's awkward. Yeah, it's... <laughs> okay, so that's the argument in favor of the corn shell. Does Matt. <laughs> okay. okay, I think that's it. Thank you. Oh, we have to get to the Phoenix talk.